that is, how could a European discover something that somebody else already knew about? You know, uh, and we're talking about North America, Central America, and South America. And it's really a mind blower if you sit down and think about who wrote the history book. I try and share it with my students this morning that a peace treaty is something very interesting. It is something that is written by the victor and signed by the loser. History isn't that much different either. The agreed upon table, propaganda. But when you look at it in the final analysis, the history that we have been taught in North America, specifically the United States, is propaganda. And propaganda is not a bad word, particularly when you understand its purpose. Its purpose is to maintain and perpetuate European values. But you see, what we must do, and what Dr. Ben Sterner is going to do, is to show you that European values are fine. But when we look at the Western Hemisphere, we will become fully aware that there are some people here before Europeans. Way before Europeans. And they left their calling cards. You understand what I'm trying to say? And so hence when we start talking about the good old folks, the Europeans, and we begin to name them Columbus and Balboa and called the conquistadors, which means that they were conquerors, thieves. We're going to find out very, very clearly that they just happened to get here, trying to get somewhere else. So I'm not going to tell you what all Dr. Van Sturm is going to say, because I'm sure he can say it much better than I. But I would like to give you some information about Dr. Van Sturm. He's born in Vienna. South America, educated at the School of Oriental and African Studies, London University, and the Rutgers Graduate School, and holds degrees in African Studies, Linguistics, and Anthropology. He's a literary critic, a linguist, an anthropologist, and he's made a name for himself in all three fields. As a critic, he is the author of Caribbean writer, a collection of critical essays on the Caribbean novel. He is also the author of several major literary reviews published in Denmark, India, Britain, and the United States. He was honored for his work in this field by being asked by the Nobel Committee of the Swedish Academy to nominate candidates for the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Literature from 1976 to 1980. As a linguist, he has published essays on the dialect of the Sea Islands off the Georgia coast. He is also the compiler of the Swahili Dictionary of Legal Terms, based on his fieldwork in Tanzania, East Africa. He is also the author of They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence, in Ancient America, which was published by Random House in 1977 and is now in its 10th printing. It was published in French in 1981 and in the same year was awarded the Clarence L. Hope Prize, a prize awarded every two years for a work of excellence in literature and the humanities relating to the cultural heritage of African and the African diaspora. Professor Van Sturgeva is an Associate Professor of African Studies at Rutgers University in New Jersey and editor of the Journal of African Civilization. He was also 
visiting professor at Princeton University from 1981 through 1983. Please join me in giving Professor Van Sertima a royal welcome. When I had completed and published my major work, they came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America. When it came out, it was wrongly attacked by the New York Times. The New York Times spent three pages of its book review claiming that this work was a fraud and that I was a myth maker. They had chosen the Walt Disney Professor of Archaeology in Cambridge University in order to make this attack. I learned earlier from sources in the New York Times that when the review was sent into the New York Times, the New York Times was amazed by the fact that it had not a single argument against me. They had to return it to the critic and say, apart from the vituperation, could you make a point or two that shows that it is a myth? And he made the point that I had mixed up step pyramids with true pyramids, which in fact is not true because they have x-rayed the pyramids and they have found steps inside of the true pyramids. In other words, the step remains at the core of the structure. But that is not what amazed me so much. What amazed me is that the New York Times had gone over all the American reviewers, people who had done serious work in American prehistory, people who had done serious work in Africa, to pick a man who had never done work in either field. A man who for the last 10 years before he wrote this review was writing novels in the genre of Ed Ellery Queen, who had never visited these archeological sites and was merely a Britisher attacking a colonial. This is at the root of a great deal of things. Because the colonization of man in the Americas and in Africa does not stop with slavery or second-class citizenship. We are not speaking of these bonds which we appear to have broken. We are speaking of chains which we, from which we are not yet free. We are speaking of the colonization of the imagination. And it became clear to me after looking at those attacks and after being involved in that controversy for many years, it became clear to me how absolutely vital it was that we should have a new school of historians. How vitally necessary it was that we should have a forum through which we could express through which we could reveal the facts of history. We have that school today. It is in its beginnings, but it is making a tremendous impact. Here in the audience today, we have Renoko Rashidi, for example, who co-edited with, co with me African presence in early Asia. He is part of that school. We have begun something which will take us through this century into the other century. And let me make it quite clear. We are not just interested in excavating dead facts. We are interested in bringing into the mainstream of American consciousness and the consciousness of the world things that revise, that challenge, that change in a substantial and revolutionary way the thinking and feeling of centuries. It is only in that way that history becomes alive and significant. History is not a dead thing. It is not the mere accumulation of facts. It is the creation of a different vision, a different way of seeing, thinking, and feeling. People say, why do we want to know what Africans did a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago? It doesn't matter. It matters. Because what happened 10,000 years ago or 10 minutes ago occupies the same room in consciousness. What happened in history or what we believe happened in history affects the way we think. It affects our prejudices, 
our reflexes, our conceptions of ourselves, the way people conceive of us, the way we treat ourselves, the way we are treated by others. History, therefore, has a lot to do with the living present. No man can be truly released from the past until he understands the past. And no man can be released the full potential of man for work in the living present that leads him into a new future cannot be activated until he has this very alert, alive and discriminating relationship and connection with the past. That is why we speak of these things today. I was particularly aware from the kinds of criticisms that fell upon me that we really, very few of us have any idea of what the Africans were involved with before slavery. All of us know, for example, the familiar story of slavery in the Americas. But few of us know what an enormous trauma, what a catastrophe struck Africa itself. So that thousands and thousands of books have been written about Africa and Africans that gives us not a clue of the complexity the potential, the capacity of Africans at the time they were struck down, at the time their continent was split and partitioned and colonized. It is only within the last few years that archaeologists have given us the faintest glimpse of the lineaments of an African science, its technology. We discovered, for example, in 1978, two of our professors, Schmidt and Avery of Brown University, discovered Africans were smelting steel 1,500 to 2,000 years ago. In that time, there was the smelting of steel in the world, but nobody, no country, no people on earth achieved the extraordinary technological complexity of the Africans. The American team showed that the Africans were smelting steel, the finest bloom of carbon steel in the world, in an industrial site along the lakes Tanzania, East Africa, that they were smelting it the temperatures of 1,850 degrees centigrade. No machine until the end of the 19th century ever achieved that temperature. The highest ever achieved in the world before the Africans was 1,620 degrees centigrade in a second century Roman blast furnace. And even when George Wilhelm Cement, the German scientist, discovered a process for smelting steel on a mass scale, the European process in the mid-19th century was not as advanced as the African process at least 1,500 years earlier. Because the European process produced steel in two crude stages, the Africans did it in a single stage through the crystallization of iron involving a semiconductor technology unknown until the 20th century. And they found further that the Africans were doing all this using less fuel. We usually assume Africa is full of jungles, great forests and woodlands, etc., and therefore they always had this forest reserve. The Africans were actually forced into fuel-saving technology in this industrial site very early. Because Africa, in fact, and I will repeat this until it sinks into your head, Africa has less jungles than any other continent comparable with its land space. Africa has less jungle than any other continent comparable with its land space. If you were to take two Europes and put it in Africa, which you can, there is more woodland and forest in two Europes than in Africa, the comparable land space. I grew up in the jungle. I was born in the city of Georgetown, but I spent 14 years in Jungle. And I'm not talking about little bush. I'm talking about real jungle. The jungle you see in Raiders of the Lost Ark. The deep South American rainforest. And I don't know of any African who has spent that much time in the jungle. There is not a single high culture, not a single civilization in Africa that grew up in the jungle whether it is the Ethiopian civilization or the classical Egyptian civilization or the artists in North Africa 
or the Afro-Phoenician civilization of Carthage, or Ghana, Mali, or Songhai in West Africa, or Monomotapa, the seat of an empire in Southern Africa. Not one. There are whole empires in Africa, like medieval Mali, for example, which the Arabs said dwarfed the Holy Roman Empire, which contained as much space as all the states of Western Europe put together. There was not a single slice of jungle in that empire. The Africans there traded with all the Africans in the jungle, but they would not advance into the jungle. They were terrified of it. The reason why we have so many thousands of books on African jungle apart from Tarzan, the reason why we have so many books on Africans in the jungle or little primitives or rural tribesmen on scratching or living on the edge of periphery of civilization is because the core and center of African civilizations receded into shadow while its broken bones were put on spectacular display. Therefore, it is only within recent times that we are finding the steel smelting machines. Only within recent times that we are finding that Africans were involved in complex astronomy. Before I speak about their astronomy, their medicine, their scripts, their metallurgy and other aspects of their science, let me say something about how this picture came about. Africa literally disintegrated on the centuries of onslaught from without. Not only America, and mo most of us have no idea of what America was. When I was growing up as a boy, I grew up among primitive Native Americans. I had no idea then, as I grew up amongst them, that behind me lay the heights of Mapupiku. A city carved out of sheer rock, calling for technological ingenuity unparalleled in the world. I had no idea of my cousins in Mexico. It was Cortez, not Columbus, who gave us some idea of the technological complexity of the heartland of America. Columbus wandered among the primitives on the edge of America. Columbus never once, never once set his foot on the American continent. On his third voyage, on August the 7th, 1498, three of his ships landed in South America. He did not come off the ship. He said he had arthritis. Did not come off the ship. Sent the landing party aboard, and a few days later, when he got into the Caribbean, he reported back on a mailboat to Spain that South America was an island, just as the landmass he had struck was an island, and just as he had reported earlier that Cuba was the continent. Just as he reported earlier that he was in India. <laughs> Just as he reported earlier that the people were being called Caribs, when in fact Carib comes from Caraib, which means foreigner, they were calling the Spanish Caraib. These clowns, who knew nothing about linguistics or geography, or had no advanced science, stumbled into the Caribbean looking for gold, thinking they were in Asia. Columbus never saw the complexity of the Americas. It was Cortez, the first modern European of that Columbus era, who reported on what he saw in the core and heartland and center of American civilization. And Cortez said, and I quote him, when I saw their pyramids and their palaces and their temples and their floating gardens, the Chinampas, the most advanced agricultural technique then in the world, known only in medieval Ghana and Mexico. And their aqueducts and their reservoirs and their zoos and their running baths. There were very few running baths then in Europe. He said, I have not seen its like anywhere. But what do we know of the American Indian? The edge, the periphery, the savages, the primitives. I grew up. I come to the city, I see movies for the first time. What do I see? I see these strange half-naked savages running about. And there is John Wayne and Ronald Reagan picking them off from the shadow. Those are the images. And it affects the colonized people throughout the world. Because it's one thing to invade, all people have invaded or been invaded. This is another thing to wipe out the memory of their history until they themselves 
not only forget, but begin to preach and to propagate the same fiction about themselves that others have propagated. And when new facts emerge, and they're irrefutable, you find not only the Eurocentrics who will contest with you, but even those people who should know better, or at least attempt to know better, because they shouldn't know better, they're part of this civilization, they're part of its falsehood, and should at least attempt to revise their conceptions, they become involved in it. What lay at the center of African civilization before its disintegration is only now being discovered, as I say. Two years ago, one of our Earth satellites spinning around this planet sent off radar beams into Africa, 16 feet below the African Earth, and found the traces of ancient rivers running from the Sahara towards the Nile Valley, where the Africans retreated as the Sahara, Sahara dried up, peopling Ethiopia and then Egypt. I said that before the Earth satellite. I said that in my book seven years ago. A few anthropologists said it based on linguistic evidence, the spread of linguistic networks coming out of the Saharan era on basis of agricultural techniques coming from the Saharan agricultural complex into the Sudanic agricultural complex moving up from Nubia into Egypt. On the basis of the movement of scripts, the markings on the rocks, etc., how they were, on the basis of skeletal material which showed, like in the Scandinavian expedition to Sudanese Nubia, showed the movement, the migration of these people. It was only in 1962 that we found the last critical thing, one of the most important discoveries in African civilization in the last 300 years. We found the last missing link that now establishes beyond the shadow of a doubt, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that classical Egyptian civilization and its science is fundamentally African. We discovered at Tarsetti, at Kustal in Nubia on the edge of the Sudan, a kingdom, a black monarchy, preceding the Egyptian by at least 200 years. And in that area, at that city, in the Nile Valley, which we now call the Middle East, we found a black kingdom where 12 black kings reigned before the Africans pushed up further into Egypt. They had already in Egypt before their kings pushed up in Egypt, controlling the northern area and establishing the dynasty of Medes which is followed for about a thousand years by predominantly African types. Pyramid building, mummification, the deities that were to build the, the pantheon of gods of the Egyptians, all the religious, political, and scientific traditions that were to make classical Egypt the beginning of the pharaonic thing is found in Nubia at Kusta, 200 years before it even begins to take a shape and to be carried forward into Egypt. We have even found the hieroglyphs, which we thought was Egyptian in origin. It was merely refined further by the Africans as they moved up in Egypt. We find the hieroglyphs at Kusta in Nubia, one of the world's most significant writing systems. Significant because it would affect not only Africans, it would have an influence also on some of the European writing systems. We are supposed to be the preliterates. When I was going to London University, the School of Oriental and African Studies, they always referred to Africans as preliterates. There's something missing in our brain. We learn to write late. No, sir. No, sir. Africans had at least half a dozen scripts before they were touched by Europe. They built the hieroglyphic script and the oldest books in the world of which we still have fragments in spite of massive destruction in the long span of time. The oldest medical texts and the oldest mathematical texts in the world are African. There is no doubt about it. Absolutely none. This is not speculative romantic myth-making. These are the facts. Not only did they have the hieroglyphic script which we find originated among the blacks 
prior to their movement up with it into Egypt, they have found also the Meroitic script. We have found 800 and something texts in that. It has not yet been deciphered. We have the Akan script, both the drum script, which is highly complex because the Africans are the only people who created drums that could mimic the human voice. So they have both a drum script in Akan as well as a written script in Akan. They have the Afaka script, which I found people in Suriname in 1981 were writing letters to their girlfriend in the Afaka script which they brought with them to the Americas. That was unusual because most Africans lost, lost their scripts. Those who did have scripts lost them in the Middle Passage, but they had made the mistake of bringing a whole tribe, a whole body of people into Suriname. That's why they were able to be both. They could communicate with each other, whereas the normal practice with slaves is that you separate them so they could start fighting among each other, or at least not have any proper communication. And also the Manzing script, which Professor Winters and Howe and Delaporte have shown to be pre-European, pre-colonial period, Manzing running through the Sahara, touching parts of the Ethiopian and even the Egyptian world. Those are just a few. And people say, yes, but if they had scripts, why didn't they write books? They wrote books. The Library of Alexandria had, had this estimated at least half a million books. It was systematically destroyed. The Moors had books. Not all of them were black, but most of them, especially the al and Al-Bahari dynasties, the four Muslim dynasties in Europe, they wrote books. In 1492, the year Columbus sailed, when Cardinal Simonin, attacking Granada, ordered after they defeated Granada, Cardinal Simonin ordered every book in Arabic to be burned. At the time when most Africans and Arabs and even the Jews in Spain and Portugal wrote in Arabic. They burnt them all. Only a few fragments survived. Timbuktu was raised to the ground twice. Only recently the Arabs have found scraps and fragments coming from the University of Timbuktu. So it's not a question of not writing books. Only a few people wrote, even in Europe. When the Muslims invaded Europe, it is estimated that 99% of the Europeans were illiterate. This is in 711 AD. 99%. The European Christians had two universities. The Muslims introduced 17. In Europe, 17 universities. Everything that was of value throughout the civilized world. In Africa, particularly in Egypt, in Greece, which had borrowed so heavily from the Egyptians, in Persia, in China, in India, everything they could fight, put their hands upon the Muslims had translated into Arabic and shared it with the Europeans. It was not an invasion at all, like the invasion that struck Africa and decimated the population and disintegrated the national and familial networks. The Moors did not attempt to destroy the culture of Europe. They did not take away the tongues of the Europeans. They did not stop them having selecting their judges and their courts. They did not interfere with their civil administration. They did not tell them that they could not believe in Jesus because Jesus had been incorporated into the Mohammedan world as a prophet just like Muhammad. All they ask is that they should have a say in the selection of bishops. Hence, it is in the heart of Europe at the time when it was in a twilight after the great strides of the Greeks and the Romans. When Europe was in twilight, the tax from Africa and the Arab world brought about a composite of world science from India. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The Europeans were not using ciphers and numbers. The Greeks and the Romans used letters for numbers. Those numbers came from the Hindu brought by the Muslims. Five and in 1202 visited India, brought in the numbers. The Europeans would not accept it. The church said their numbers are works of the devil. That was the level of science. The few European geniuses who struck 
out, they were tortured. And European genius have given clear testimony to African genius. Isaac Newton, the most important, the greatest of all European scientists before Einstein. Newton said there were three things that he could credit to the Africans in Egypt. He said the Africans were the first to develop an atomic theory. They were speaking of atoms as monads. They hadn't reached the point which we have recently reached of atomic fission. No, that was far away in the future. But they saw the atom as the building block of the universe. That is no easy thing in those times because the atom is invisible. He spoke of the heliocentric theory. He said they had already seen that that they had already spoke of the planets spinning around the sun. They didn't plot all the planets, they knew of at least five of the nine we talk about today. He said they knew about gravitation, that the harmony of the spheres which Pythagoras stole from the Egyptians. The Africans had worked that out, they knew the peculiar attraction of objects to a spinning body in the sky and the the rotation and the orbit, the fixed orbits of planets, etc. They had all worked that out very, very early. When I spent some time at NASA, NASA informed me, NASA, you know, and these people had nothing, no axe to grind by telling me that. They told me that the Africans were the first to attempt to work on an aeroplane. That as early as 300 BC, the Africans had created a glider. We have no idea that it had an engine. It had some method of power. It had, they saw the rudder was detached. They attached part of the tail fin to the rudder. It had a reverse dihedral um, wing shape. They were aware of the fact that it was heavy than air, and yet it could fly through the air, a glider. 300 years before Christ, it was found at Saqqara. They are aware of the mathematics. People have said, even now, that they're finding that as they go back into history, it becomes blacker and blacker. They say that the Egyptian arithmetic, the Egyptian geometry and so forth, which they took because they had their own arithmetic, they took geometry, they had their own arithmetic, but yet they found the Egyptian arithmetic more accurate. It didn't come from people just sitting down and saying, well, an inch is a hmm. It came from looking at the sky. Everything that they learned from that cosmos, they put it into their work. They were the first to create the 24-hour day. They were the first, the Africans in Egypt were the first to create the precise measurement of the year, 365 and a quarter days. But whereas when it was taken over, we created a leap day every four years to deal with that quarter. The Africans created a true leap year every 1,460 years. And whereas we take that leap year, that leap day, sorry, and we take the five days at the end of the year and spread it out, the Africans cut the year into 360 days. They made five festival days for the gods, and they were the first to create December the 25th as a holiday for the Christ figure. There was no Jesus then, but Jesus, the last, the most remarkable of the Christ figures in the world, his birthday was taken from January the 6th and put on the African birthday, December the 25th. They had the five festival days for the gods, and they had 12 precise months of 30 days. When the Greeks and Romans took that over, they spread it out throughout the year. As a result, we have 28-day month, 29-day month, 30-day month, 31-day month. We need a rhyme in order to remember which is which. <laughs> These contributions are not acknowledged. One is not attempting to say Africans were first in everything. That is nonsense. We are not attempting to say Europeans did not have genius, that everything they did, they borrowed from the Africans. No, sir, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that we have been so colonized that the books we read, the films we see, the way we are taught is such that we have completely 
develop, we have developed an amnesia of all of Africa's contribution. And all we know about is what Europe did. What it created, what it invented. We are the people who invented nothing, explored nothing. We are the static primitives of the world. And all I am saying is that is not true. That is not true. And our civilization can never be altered, can never be changed, can never move away from the impact in which it stands today because the third world, whether you ignore it or not, whether you deny it or not, whether you seek to crush it or not, whether you seek to sustain its enslavement or not, the world cannot progress beyond its present impact, its horror, unless we begin to learn again what really happened in the world and to give credit where credit is due and to have a different conception of the human being regardless of the race or color of that human being. That is why we go back. That is why history is such a living thing. That is why it does not stop at being a mere accumulation of the past. What we are digging up now, what we are revealing now, what we are propagating now can help slowly but inevitably to correct the bias of the past. A bias that has locked more than half of the human race in chains that are not yet broken. Our young people are in frightening distress. Make no mistake about it. Some of them have a void where their brain should be. They're not even making use of the five ounces that it took a billion years to create. They're walking about like zombies on the earth. They are mere extensions of a culture that negates them. We cannot ignore these things. Only history can correct that because it becomes for us almost like a religious reformation. It becomes a crusade. It becomes something that can redeem a people and a civilization and a time. When we think of the things they have found, one of the most astonishing things is African astronomy. They found an African astronomical observatory 300 years before Christ in Kenya at a place called Namorotunga on the basis of the lineage of the stones of that observatory, the Africans had created one of the most accurate of prehistoric calendars. It was not their first, as I say, they were the first to create the most accurate calendar, a stellar calendar, based on the Sophic cycle, the star Sirius, whereas the Babylonians had a lunar calendar and was far less, far less precise and scientific as Egyptian. They're trying to show that Egyptian science is merely empirical, that Egyptians, the early Africans, merely arrived at this by trial and error. Real science, abstract science, pure science, begins with the Europeans, the Greeks. But they had a computer programmed in the United States in 1967 to test this theory. You know what the computer found? And the computer was created 4,000 years after the height of Egyptian civilization. The computer found that of 22,000, 295 possible decompositions. The Africans had chosen the 46 simplest and most elegant, and that the computer would have made the same choice. That is the level of theoretical science. Without that quality of science, it would not be possible to create the pyramid. That is no simple monument of stone to some dead pharaoh. every step, every passageway, every ventilator shaft, every temple, every room, its dimensions were determined by what the Africans had found in the cosmos. They would call these things sacred numbers. They would take things down just as they put it in their mathematics. The second of time was created by the African. The second of inch was created by the African. And many famous Europeans were aware of that. Galileo, we talked a moment ago about Newton. Galileo used the African water clock in his experiments. He had a people without time. Any colored people like to talk about, or rather, 
black people like to talk about colored people start. There's no such thing. They made that up. That's part of their slavery. Because the Africans had precise ways of dealing with time. There is the peasant thing, but it runs through Europe. I lived among European peasants as well as African peasants. I've lived among European urbanites as well as African urbanites. I spent a year in Hungary in the borders of Czechoslovakia. I used to speak Hungarian, not anymore. But I went into villages in Europe where they have never seen a black man in all history. People came out in crowds. The way the poor engines came when they saw Columbus. <laughs> I found in some villages as many as 20 Europeans using one bath. Who writes about that? That gives you no sense of European genius. The Europeans have done remarkable things in the world. No one denies that. And since their conquest of America and Africa, which enriched them a thousandfold, they have been able to seize the technological initiative, though not completely. So we appear as people have done nothing. but. The Wall Street Journal, using the same terms I have used, people at the core and people at the periphery pointed out that while at the core you have the brilliant flash of Europe, when you go to the periphery, it's semi-barbaric. Nobody writes about that. Why is it that when you deal with Europe, you always see the core? But when you're dealing with Africans and American Indians, they bring their cameras and put it on the periphery so that we all look like a lost, battered, broken, who never did anything in the world. So that when they found the Dogon plotting an invisible star seven centuries before European astronomers discovering a 50-year elliptical orbit and an orbit of one year on its own axis, discovering a dwarf nova which we only discovered from the Einstein orbiting satellite two years ago, dancing the orbit right up to 1990, we find that on the orbit they plotted seven years ago, our best machine plotted a few years ago, they are identical. You know what they said, Kenneth Bretch at MIT? You know what he said? The Africans have no business doing any of this. <laughs> and he's bloody right. The Africans, as we have been made to think they were, have no business knowing anything. But when we find that, we cannot explain it. We cannot explain it because we have conceived of these people in a certain way. The Russians have pointed out that the Africans have had telescopes. Some years ago, on December the 4th, 1975, I took up the op-ed page in the New York Times. I don't think anybody was ever given three quarters of a page in the New York Times. That was the first time that any black got that opportunity. I had some friends then. There was a battle for five there, were, there was a battle of five weeks as to whether they should publish my article. It was sub it was headed Archaeology Discovery of an African Presence in America. The New York Times put this up here. Bad news for Columbus, perhaps. <laughs> there was no perhaps about it. It was just simply bad news. Yeah. <laughs> all over the world. One of them came in from one of the Russian science cities in Soviet Asia. Academician Sanarov wrote me saying the Russians had done a lot of researches on Pacific migration, apart from the Bering Strait migrations which we all accept during the Ice Age and so forth. We have evidences of Chinese and Japanese coming into America from the side, the Pacific side. I mentioned the Japanese. German pottery, Valvidian period, etc. in Ecuador, but the Russians said they never thought of even dealing with Atlantic migrations because the Russians, until recently, have been very affected by Western propaganda. Though they did not, and that they did not have colonials. I mean, they have colonized Eastern Europe, but they did not have black colonials. So they knew nothing about Africa. And when Vavilov, the Russian botanist, started the agricultural systems world left out Africa. Now we find that the Sudanic and Saharan agricultural systems are the earliest in the world. But, they
they can't stand in this dialogue. It's done in the first with great distrust. The Russians are very careful. They have to be careful. The scientists have to be careful of their government. Their government have to be careful of the people outside. So he would write me on big postcards. Okay. And in the during the dialogue in which I shared my researches, etc., and uh, there is now a negotiation for a Russian edition that they came before Columbus because it's time they learn about that too. But during the dialogue, I asked them to tell me anything that they had found that would be of great interest to me about early African civilization because they were doing a lot of work in Egypt on the NASA. So that kicked them out because archaeology is sometimes used as a cover for spying. But they said that one of their scientists, Colosino, discovered perfectly ground spherical crystal lenses in ancient Egypt, indicating clearly that Africans could have built early telescopes. Galileo said so. Now we know because either the Dogon got it from the Egyptians or they developed their own. It is true that the African eye has a different shutter speed. When I because of the intensities of light in those areas. When I was a boy, I can't do it now. When I was a boy, I could see seven miles across the water to markings on the quarry rocks across in Esquivo. Um, it is something that I become aware of in the industrial world that people do not have ears and eyes and noses as I do. For example, I regret having a sharp ear because I've often heard people talking about me behind my back. <laughs> that ear was trained not to pick up things like that. It was trained in order to tell the distinction between the breaking of a twig and the slithering of a snake. If you can tell that from six feet away, you will not be in the jungle for very long. I could tell, for example, by looking at the water on, as I rafted down the river, I could tell by looking at the water whether the current was too deep for me to dive in, whether there were tiger fish below, because if you can't tell from the water what is going on below, you jump off of your raft, you may never rise again. Okay, so all of those things as a primitive, I appreciate. I am not dismissing the primitive, but I am saying that you cannot go to the primitive to learn about what is happening in the civilization. That is the reason why we miss so many things. Take medicine. That is one of the most awesome things about Africans. The Africans did incredible things in medicine. Let me just touch the Egyptians first and then deal with Africans outside of Egypt. The Egyptians were the first, according to Herodotus, to have specialists for every organ. They were the first to have pharmacies because they found standardized doses. They were the first to have a state medicine. Their doctors were paid by the state. And we have found Ten medical texts, despite the massive destruction, ten medical texts survived. The Evers Papyrus and the Edward Smith Papyrus, 1500 BC, 2600 BC. And do you know one of them is in New York? The actual manuscript written by Africans 1500 years before Christ is in New York, the School of Medicine. And do you know what chapters they had in that manuscript? Chapters on helminthiasis, ophthalmology, gynecology, gynecology, pregnancy, diagnosis, treatment of abscesses and burns, study of the pulp, diagnostic percussion, notes on circulation of the blood, little things like fractures of the clavicle and dislocation of the mandible, which Herodot, which Hippocrates lifted and put in his book. <laughs> Harmony of opposites, all those theories were worked out. There was only one chapter in magic. I know we are famous for magic. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we know of these things? Because when people study Africa, they like the exotic. All of my professors, as I like to say, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, the one school in the world which I understand has more professors than students, they were all world authorities and something. World authorities and what? 
I had such a profound reverence for my professors until I began to realize that to be a world authority in something, if it is very small, doesn't mean very much. World authorities are booga boogas and looga boogas. <laughs> Who the hell cares? <laughs> you can study the booga booga until you're blue in the face. You cannot arrive at any vision of African possibility and potential. You cannot arrive at any vision of African complexity. Thus, we have thousands of books in Africa that are absolutely waste. Absolute waste. You cannot extrapolate from one little primitive tribe what is happening at the central heartland of a civilization. The Journal of African Civilizations makes a serious departure because I take the primitive off center stage and put the brilliant African, the quintessential African into the center where he belongs. <laughs> and only by doing that can we have a balance achieved. Only by doing that can we have a new scientific objectivity. Only by doing that can we face and challenge seriously the myth of biological inferiority because these myths still persist. They persist because people could say, what have you done? You know, Kirkpatrick asked that of Baldwin some years ago. What has the Negro ever done for civilization? He hasn't the foggiest idea of this so-called civilization. Is it composite? It is not European, Western civilization. The Greeks could not have gone where they gone, had gone without the Egyptians. Every major Greek scholar, Thales, of Militus, Democritus, Pythagoras, Plutus, and Aximander, and Aximenes, Heraclitus, Plato, Aristotle, all of them studied in Africa. <laughs> without the Hindu numerical system, without the Chinese compass, Chinese gunpowder, without Asiatic and African elements brought together by the Moors, even the fire sticks, the so-called guns which we think were invented in Europe. No, sir, the Russians have recently shown an Arabic manuscript of the Muslims attacking the Indians in the Muslim invasion of India, the first guns being used, which were brought into Europe. Even the scales on the, the caravels of Columbus and Vespucci were not European scales. There were Arab Latin states and the nautical instruments, the compass and the astrolabe which they were using to come here were not invented in Europe. They couldn't even plot latitude and longitude. Columbus struck out for the latitude of Japan hoping to land in India. <laughs> Claim this was India. That's why we're still calling the poor Americans Indians. And we're calling the Caribbean West Indies. This is place was actually called India. And you know the extent to which Columbus went, went to establish he was in India? He sent his notary Fernando Pires the Luna among the ships and made every man sign a document that he was off the, off the continent of Asia. And he threatened his men. He said if any man were later to say they hadn't come to India, if they were officers, they would be fined 500 maravedis stopped several months after, and if they were common sailors, they would be given 100 lashes and have their tongues cut off. How many of us know that? It's written down here, you know, it's in several languages. John Boyd Thatcher in 1903 printed a book, three volumes, 2,140 pages. I went through that thing with a fine tooth comb. Seven languages drawn, the diaries, all the comments, etc. You know why Columbus went to that extent? Because Marco Polo had fired imagination of Europe. The thoughts of all the gold and spices in the Indies. And Columbus said, since the world is wrong, you could go to the west and end up in the east, which is theoretically true, but you need an aeroplane to do it. Not his little boats. <laughs> it is true that after there was a massive continuous movement out of the breach for gold, Europe made advances in shipping that took her beyond other peoples, the hull, sails, etc. But at that time they were using other people's stuff. And it is important 
to note that the people who made those early journeys for the Spanish and the Portuguese, where the Africans and Arabs had been and brought things from the rest of the world since 711 AD up to 1492. And it's not just the Industrial Revolution. You take modern times. I spent some time at NASA. I'm one of the few blacks who has flown in a military aircraft to Cape Canaveral to witness the blast off the spaceship shuttle. Not the last unfortunate one, but the one that took Bluford up in August of 1983. I had been invited to witness the blast off the space shuttle because I was the first black to write an article on black space science along with one of the administrators of the educational program at NASA. When I, I spent the day before the blast off meeting black scientists and central hearing them talk, a whole day was devoted to black scientists and they spoke of incredible things. I learned, for example, that we were getting 500 pages per second of information from outer space. We do not have enough analysts to deal with that. NASA said that we needed 50, immediately we needed 50 blacks with MAs in physics and chemistry and so forth. They wanted to employ them instantly to draft them in the program. I have got about three people placed at NASA, students I have met across the country who have those requirements. The black doesn't get to the top easily. There was a joke going around NASA about a shipwreck in which four people were saved. Three white, one black. The captain, who not he was white, said to the crew, we only have enough rations for three people to take us to shore. And I want to be very fair. I'm going to ask you three questions. Which man can't answer, he goes overboard. So he turned to the first white man and he said, when did the Titanic sink? The guy said, you know, um, nine, nine, 1915, I think it was. Then he turned to the second white man and he said, how many people drunk? He said, 1,500. Then he turned to the black and said, name them. <laughs> so you understand how difficult it is to get to the top. <laughs> and to stay there in spite of these difficulties. In spite of these difficulties, the man, the boy who won, there are two blacks who have won national prizes in the space science program. One of them whom I met, Anthony something, I forget his name now, whom I met, he's from New Jersey too. He sent the first ant colony into space. This boy is about 16. The one who won the best prize, the national award for the best project sent up in a space shuttle a black boy who has not yet entered college. Do you know what he did? He sent up a, an experiment dealing with the de-icing of the wings of airplanes. He had solved the problem that led to the Air Florida jet crashing in the Potomac. Do you know anything about this? Do you know that the leading black at NASA, Major Gillam the Fourth, is the man who coordinated the work of all of our scientists in order to produce the world's first space shuttle? Do you know that the leading technical astronaut in our space team is a black man, Colonel Frederick Gregory, the first black to pilot the space shuttle? Do you know how many things he's responsible for how many inventions. He's invented the alternate power controller which cuts pilot fatigue in half. With one hand you could control the whole aircraft, leaving the other hand free. Do you know that he invented the micro-instrumentation landing system which locks a computer which locks the airplane from the ground and brings it down safely, whether the pilots are dead, blind or drunk? <laughs> we don't know anything about this. Do you know that the leading researcher at NASA, the head of the hypersonic research team, is a black woman, Dr. Christine Darden, that she has solved the sonic boom factor which troubles us tremendously. And as a consequence of her work, we will be able to fly several times the speed of sound at the whisper. Do you know 
that one of the leading engineers, the one who is long as many hours as any spaceman in weightlessness, is a black engineer, Bob Sherney, who goes up quite frequently in the KC-139, KC-13509 aircraft, which flying a parabolic curve achieves the state of weightlessness for 30 seconds is the only aircraft we have that does that. It's known as the vomit comet. Because when you spin in that circle, you better know what you're doing because all your breakfast comes out. <laughs> he has tested many things he sent up into space. Do you know that the leading medical researcher of our space team, the space medical research, is a Hispanic woman, Dr. Patricia Cowens, and a black Dr. Long, and that Cowens has invented a machine that they say quantifies yoga. Many of the involuntary muscular nervous system can be now controlled in Western physical science. We get very involved with the surface thing. But when you go into space, you can't go jogging in the morning. It's not like Starship Enterprise. It's a little box. So you have to learn to exercise sitting down, and that's exactly what this does. You can learn within six weeks to lower your heart rate or carry it up, to lower your blood pressure or take it up. Something, a spin-off so critical, so critical to hypertension problems on Earth. But let me just talk about space. Let me talk about African medicine. Do you know they have discovered Africans pioneered several surgical operations. Eye cataract surgery, unknown in the European and Arab world, was pioneered in Africa, Jenny, in the city of Mali in the 13th century. The Arabs reported that. Do you know the Africans pioneered in brain surgery? They were cutting circular holes in the skull, relieving pressure from the brain with an 85% success. Facts of both grew back. Do you know the Africans invented the vaccine? They came upon the vaccine by um, puncturing holes in the skin for identification and beautification markings and they came upon the vaccine so that in an epidemic they would scratch the germ, they would take the germ from someone who is sick and put a little of it into all the people in the tribe so that they could develop an immunity to it. Do you know the Africans were using aspirin long before us? The Bantu were using salix capensis which seems salicylic acid active ingredient in aspirin. Do you know they were using tetracycline, an antibiotic, 14 centuries ago? They found the yellow-green flash of tetracycline in bones of at Nubia, in Nubia. And while it appeared in their brain been indicating they had come upon it perhaps initially as an accident, they were using it in conscious measured doses because where it was found, there was the lowest incidence of infectious disease in the ancient population. Do you know that they had done the most advanced cesarean sections? When Dr. Pelking and his team, and by the way, before I leave tetracycline, 14 centuries ago among the Africans, you know when we began using tetracycline in this population in the 1950s. The cesarean section was observed, the cesarean operation was observed by a team from Britain under Dr. Pelkin. He noticed with amazement that Africans were using the cautery iron with tremendous skill, causing very minor tissue damage. They had a way of closing the wound, stopping bleeding, cutting the belly open without causing major tissue damage, stitching. They even took pictures of the stitching that collapsed the abdominal wall. Do you know that not a single woman in Europe in the operating theaters of Europe survived the in the 1870s. Among the Africans, they noticed the woman came out hale and hearty in four days out of the hospital. They noticed the Africans were using antiseptics and anesthetics at the time when Lister had only introduced antiseptics in Europe two years earlier. They were doing this with routine skill, indicating that to perform that operation for a long time. Do you know the Africans were the first to pioneer in using drugs to treat hypertension and psychotic disorder? One of their drugs, Reserpine, is used in the Western world. We don't know anything about this. When you study African medicine, you go to the witch doctor. 
that's exotic. People want that for their film. They want that for their little anthropological studies. And the reason why anthropologists get involved, in, I'm not saying it wasn't valuable. Some tribes were vanishing, it was good to get a record. But to seek to extrapolate from something so small, data that was to be considered as African data to cover all of Africa and the African genius, this is one of the gravest, gravest pieces of misinformation because a partial truth is worse than a lie. I must close now. And let me close because there is so much to say. Let me close by saying something about the Moors. The Moors introduced air conditioning into Europe for the first time. And their air conditioning had something even up above ours. They were passing it over banks of perfume flowers, so you not only got fresh air, but perfume air. They were the first to pave the streets in Europe, the first to have rail sidewalks. You could walk for miles through certain cities where the Moors were in Spain by the flash of lamps. Something unknown, the lighted streets of Paris were to come hundreds of years later. I have a picture in that book, African Presence in Europe, of two black noblemen, Moorish noblemen, playing chess in 12th century Spain. Do you know of the impact on industry, the silk, the dates, the lemon, the ginger, the many things the fruits brought into Spain? The works on animal husbandry and agriculture that was brought into Spain. The first people to lead lead pipes from the mountains and bring water into the houses, hot and cold water, were the Moors. And when we go back, they translated everything they could find into Arabic and brought it into the heartland of Europe. When we go back there, we begin to realize how it was that the Spanish and the Portuguese made the movement into the Americas. How it was that out of a lack, out of a kind of dark age, European genius was to come alive and the industrial revolution was possible. We neglect our scientists here. Who knows that this light which pa Edison pioneered in true. Edison pioneered in electric light. We are not denying him his genius, but it was Louis Latimer, a black scientist, who invented the carbon filament that made life practical and universal. Edison could burn it for a day. Latimer could burn it for a year. Let us brood on these things because there are so many. The shoe lasting machine, the first machine, mass produced shoes, a black. The first machine with a cup to lubricate itself so critical to the mechanical industry, a black. The first to refrigerate the trucks, transforming the food transport industry in this country, a black. The first to introduce telegraphy in the train, a black. The first to transform the whaling industry in the world by the introduction of the toggle harpoon, a black. The first to transform into sugar crystals to create sugar crystals in the world which would affect the economies of England and France in the black. There were 1,000 inventions by black logged in 1930 alone. 1,000. At a time when in 18, middle of the 18th century, Jeremiah Black, the Attorney General of the United States, ruled that slaves could not patent inventions because a patent was an agreement between the government and the citizen and black slaves were not citizens. And in spite of all these disadvantages, the African genius, the black genius, emerged. Let us go with this. Let us be aware that we are not starting from scratch. Our forefathers, our ancestors are not just chicken jars. We have more significant roots in the civilizations of the world. In Asia, as Rashidi has shown us, in America, as my work has done, in Europe, as the works of Scooby and others have done, we are aware of the African influence throughout the world. We have to become aware of this in a real sense. All of us, black, white, Hispanic, 
whatever, because the history of man is the history of one family. We have been separated for centuries by myths and falsehoods, which makes us think of inferior races and superior races, inferior peoples and superior peoples. We can no longer think like that. We are on the threshold to a new age. We are on the threshold of a new consciousness. Let us walk out of the small cell and room created by Columbus, the 500-year-old room into the larger and more liberating house of history. Thank you very much. Before you go, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. First of all, if you're interested in this subject, and I know you are, Professor Van Sertema brought some of his work here.